all day long, your body is saying, fire alarm, fire alarm, fight or flight, run. And I was like, mm-hmm. Like I was sitting with him and my back felt like it was on fire. I was like, see, it's crazy. It's happening right now. It's Feel it. I think it's really hot. He was like, no, your chemicals are so messed up that your body doesn't know where you're supposed to be. Your adrenals are on fire. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every single one of you who come back every week to listen, learn, and grow. Now, you know that I love sitting down with people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, who are adding meaning, impact, and purpose into the world that have an incredible presence and use it to do so much good in the world. And today's guest is someone who has been so kind to me, so gracious to me online and offline. And our first interaction was actually this January when I announced me being the chief purpose officer at Calm. And we did a series of lives. And when this guest today said yes, I was over the moon because I love her energy. Uh, I followed her for a long, long time, admire her work. And for her to say yes was a dream come true. So today's guest is none other than Megan Trainer. And Megan first made history in 2014 with her diamond certified hit single, all about that bass. Since then, the award-winning singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist has garnered a Grammy for Best New Artist, achieved eight multi-platinum singles and two platinum albums, sold out three world tours, penned multi-platinum hits for peers across pop and country, and received countless industry awards and nominations. Now, on top of all of that, last fall, we got to watch Megan as the host of Top Chef Family Style on Peacock and as a judge on Clash of the Cover Bands on E! In September of 2021, she also launched her podcast, Working On It, which she hosts alongside her brother, Ryan. Megan has recently released her new single, Bad For Me, which by the way, my producer has been singing and listening to all week, featuring Teddy Swims, along with the announcement of her fourth full-length album, Taking It Back, arriving October 21st, 2022. Mark the date. Welcome, Megan Trainer. Megan, thank you for being here. You're amazing. No, you're amazing. <laughs> you did all of that. You I had to, can't believe you, you it. had to live it. You had to create it. You had to write it. I mean, it's incredible. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I sound so cool. <laughs> you are. When you say it, yeah. Even just your energy walking in today and I, I saw you come out the car and just your presence, your energy, everything that you said, I was just like, this is my kind of human. Like, this is the kind of person that I want to be around. <laughs> you will adopt me. Okay, yay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, honestly. Thanks for having me. I'm honored that you are, you're like Oprah. You're amazing what you do for everyone in the world. And I'm honored and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me be here. I, I'm humbled and touched by that. I actually got to say that to Oprah, to Oprah. because yep. she, I grew up watching her. And so for me, when I finally got to interview her, her book was coming out. We got to do the first interview. It's very exciting for me. And I said to her afterwards, I said, hey, Oprah, like, you know, I, I think I do what I do because I grew up watching you and you showed me that you can make meaningful stuff really powerful and it can be really mainstream. It doesn't have to be in this little box over here. And what she said to me was really special. She said that Maya Angelou said to her mm -hmm. that her best work will not be the impact she makes but the impact that the people she impacts make. And I just thought that, so anyway, I, I appreciate, but I'm passing it on to Oprah. And, and passing you're my it Oprah. On, and passing it on. Thank you so much. Uh, but I wanna dive into so many things with you today because you're just such a interesting, fascinating person. Okay. Uh, but the first thing I wanna ask you is, you have a secret door in your home. I do. I wanna know all you about know it. Because, How did you know that? <laughs> because to me, yeah, of course. Because to me, secret doors, like that's the kind, when you just showed me your garden too, and I'm not going to give anything away, but those are the kind of homes I get fascinated about because they're the kind of homes you dreamed of as a kid. Yeah, literally. So, so tell me about the secret I'm door. I'm creating my dream house for when I was a child. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now for my future four children. <laughs> I have one now, but he can barely walk. So we'll get there. Um, but I have a secret door in my house. And uh, the house I bought is really cool. Not a lot of houses in LA have attics and basement. And I have both in this house. And my husband, we did so much construction and he was like, the only thing I want, I'm like, oh, yes, what would you like, babe? And he was like, um, a secret door. So it looks like a bookshelf. And I was like, done. Absolutely. We're doing that. 
Um, and it's the best part of our tour when we give tours of our house. Everyone's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Where does it lead to? Um, an attic and that I'm turning into like the best kids playground ever that I want to do like homeschooling eventually in. So yeah, we got like slides up there and <laughs> That's incredible. I, I'm, I'm inviting myself over just yes. right now already. It's so fun, man. Yeah, <laughs> my house is going to be sick one day when it's done. I love it. I'm very excited. I I went to a home when I first moved to LA. I think I was living here already. And it's the coolest house I've ever been to. His name's Frank Luntz. And he's a speech writer for most of the presidents of the United States. And that's that's his career to write speeches, teach people communication. And we spoke at a conference together in Singapore and his presentation was amazing and somehow he liked mine. And so we became friends over it uh, at the end and we got connected and he lives in LA too. And he was like, all right, when you're back, come over to my house. I was like, great. He's in his like mid fifties or something. And so I went over for dinner at his house and his house is like a museum. Like he has the first shirt that Nelson Mandela wore to the United States. And he has like all of these incredible documents, like the invite that JFK received before the assassination like he has he's just like these really amazing things and we went into this room and it had this it wasn't the titanic it was another famous boat like a structure of it and there was a little winston churchill in the corner and he asked me to stroke winston churchill's head and that's when things got really weird and then i looked at my phone i had no data i had no signal i was really scared and so i, I saw the little winston churchill and he goes yeah stroke his head three times and i was like this is getting really weird but okay i stroked winston churchill's head three times and this trap door. door opened and it was so cool. Sick. And I'll, sh I'll save the rest of it for later. But anyway, my point being, I love trap doors. Um, you also have, you also have, uh, not trap doors. I love secret doors. <laughs> secret doors. I love dungeons. Okay. Yeah, I love dungeons. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from London. Sick. The dungeon, yeah. Dungeons are a big thing in London. The London dungeons is a great attraction for anyone who's wondering. But you also have two toilets. I have two toilets. Can you, can you explain that too? Wow. You really got to come over to my yeah. house. You got to see all this. Yeah. I'm, I'm very fascinated by aesthetic my and weird stuff right um, I love it. okay so in our bedroom <laughs> upstairs there's one bathroom and the other bedrooms are farther away and my husband and i get up all night long with the baby we used to now he sleeps he's great but we used to get up all night long and every time i had to pee daryl would have to pee at the same time and i'd be like get up it's my turn and i remember in this new house we literally like built rooms from scratch and they had a bidet next to the bathroom and I was like, we'll never use that. But there was an extra hole and then I saw the dream and I was like, I have an extra toilet. And I was to the plumber, I was like, can you pop both of these next to each other? And he was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, just right there, right next to each other. And he like laughed and thought I was joking. I was like, get it done. And he did, and it was the best decision ever. <laughs> I love like, it. Like, if you're really close with your husband, like my, like we're we're tight, we're close to the most. Yeah. We like pee together, and it's the best bonding time ever. I love. Like, it. I don't know, we're not nasty with it, but like, it's <laughs> it blew up, and the whole world is like, ew. And I have couple friends that are they're older than Daryl and I are. We're young. We got lucky. We met each other at like 22, but they're like, you pee in the same room as your husband i'm like oh he'll chill with me if i'm going number two like we <laughs> hang out you know like we um, don't do it at the same time no, but yeah no. <laughs> i love We're it close. well well thank you we wanted to start you're there. welcome yeah so now now everything goes deep there's my bathroom yeah <laughs> But no, I love it. Thank you. And thank you for letting us into your home. I've, I've been loving following you on TikTok for that reason. It's just, it's so nice getting to know someone and then meeting someone in person and going, oh, you're, you're even more wonderful in person is, is a great feeling. So, uh, <laughs> But, but I, I want to go through parts of your journey that, that I thought would be interesting to us and you and just everything you talk about when it comes to mental health and you talk about like toxic relationships. And I just love your openness and vulnerability oh, yeah. in a way that I know my community and audience really needs that insight uh but i want to go all the way back to nantucket which is where you grew up Wolf. right and I, yeah yeah and, <laughs> and like you know the the feedback that i always hear about is like it's the cutest town or it's you know cute. it's like tell me about what it was like growing up there for you and you know what you dreamed of at that time the world was so small everything was so small the buildings are small so when we would go off island which was like travel anywhere else we we're like oh you going off island um like the buildings were huge and there's like traffic lights we're used to stop signs so everywhere else felt huge and i still get scared when i go to new york i'm like whoa these buildings are way too tall um and like when we park in a parking garage i have full panic because i'm like well we're gonna be late we have to find a parking spot and get a ticket it's a whole thing but nantucket was great and 
growing up there though, there's there's no mall, there's no place for kids to hang out. So you start drinking and doing drugs at like 14. Wow. And like hooking up at a very young age. And like when I look back at stuff that we did, I'm like, how was I not murdered or kidnapped or like how am I not a full blown drug addict? A lot of my friends are. Wow. And even my brother had problems with alcohol and drugs, but he managed it so well that we were like, you don't have a problem. You're just fun, you yeah. know? And then recently he was like, okay, I need to be sober. Wow. So it was, it's like, if you made it off that rock, like you won, like you survived. So it was a crazy place to live. It's, it's so different when I grew up in London, which is obviously this big city and you're always around big buildings. And then I moved to New York and I've lived in Mumbai and now I live in LA. So I've always been moving from big yeah, city to big tough. city. You got that tough, like you can handle it. <laughs> well, you can handle the city, but there's, there's also, it takes a lot more effort to feel grounded or to be in yeah. nature or, you know, that took a lot of oh, training. Oh, wow. Took a lot of training yeah. for me to adapt to that. And I also find that, you know, when, you, when you're talking about, I went to Montana recently and, and that's where, when I was speaking to a lot of the uh, people that lived in the area and a lot of the kids there were saying they'd never left. Yeah. Um, and they were saying that they all went to the same salon on a Saturday yep. evening and they, that one of them went to NYU for the summer, but then she moved back and she was like, she'd never seen a Chipotle before she'd yeah. moved out of town same. and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and it's always interesting to me because we grow up in such bubbles where you think everyone thinks like you and everyone's yeah. living like you. When was the first time that that bubble kind of was burst or changed or switched? What was the experience where you're like, oh, wow, there's a whole world and people who think differently and um i mean when my parents started bringing me to songwriting conventions like songwriting competitions and i would travel like my my brothers got a gift well it'd be a whole family thing i have two brothers so for christmas one year they're like we're gonna go to california and have megan go to this songwriting thing with ascap and the boys would get to go to the zoo you know so it'd always be a family thing but they would make sure the boys got to do something fun too but i i remember like traveling with my family and seeing Hollywood. And I was like, ew, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like oh, it's, it's a little different than the movies. But then I lived in Nashville for a year by myself. And that was my college. I was 19 and I was like a songwriter. I would drive to work at noon and I'd write a song and I'd come home by myself. And I did that for a year and then wrote all about that bass and got signed and like had to move to LA at 19. So. A lot of my friends were like in college and went home for the summer. And I was like, I didn't, I don't know. I feel like I missed a lot of learning steps yeah. and relationships. Like I feel like there, there, there's a whole friend group out there that I would have had that I don't know them, you know, because I just went to work, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Like we yeah. did it. <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's, yeah. That's... But I, there's, there's definitely differences that I'm frustrated with, like, I don't know how to do taxes. I don't know how to do many things because at 19, all of a sudden there was a team that did it for me. Yeah. And so when like, I don't know, there's simple tasks that I'm like, I can't, can't imagine doing that, that I feel, my, I'm working with my therapist on it. I feel stupid sometimes. I feel silly and like, and she's like, you're not stupid. Like, look around. And I'm like, yeah, but there's simple things I can't figure out. Geography. I don't know where <laughs> anything is. I don't well, know where well, I am in the well, world. Well, Megan, I want to I share something with you. I promise you that most people who went to college don't know how to do their taxes. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I know what, know what the, the problem, the, I'll be honest, me included. And I, I, went to, I went to Cass Business School. Like, I don't know how to do my own taxes. Okay, because, good. Because, and the reason I say that is because you're just never trained in the simple things. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's sad, but no one knows how to get a mortgage or how to, you know, yeah, how to, how no to get their taxes. Like you don't know these until you have to do it. Yeah. And then when you have to do it, you figure it out. Like for me, I had to learn a whole new system when I moved to the US. So just about when I True. figured, so I moved to the US when I was 28. And so- I'm 28. Yeah, oh, there we go, yeah. But you moved to LA when you were 19, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a different experience. But yeah, no, I, I moved to the US six years ago when I was 28. Okay. And it was like, I just figured out how to do taxes in London. And then I moved yeah, and I had to figure different. it all out again. And so, I, you know, I don't think you should be so hard on yourself okay. because because I'd be honest with you and say, I don't think most people know how to do the things you just mentioned. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> I thought everyone knew. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look at that, experience when you talk about going to songwriting competitions yeah it's really interesting because competition often turns people off art and it can often yeah. be a challenge or it's like you're competing at something and then often you lose taste for it. i remember i 
swam a lot when I was in college and, and high school and I was a pretty good swimmer and my parents really wanted me to be a competitive swimmer and I hated the competitive side of swimming. Yeah. I love competition in other areas of my life. I just didn't enjoy it in the water. For you, what was that experience like of, because that was even younger than 19, right? You're going oh, to these yeah. competitions with 17. other kids. Yeah, yeah, with other kids. But it wasn't so, even kids, it was adults. Ad oh, wow. Like it ranged from my age, 17 to like 55, where they were like, I still want to be a songwriter and here's my chance. And I would like always write on my CDs before we played it. I'd be like, I produced it myself, like be easy on the production. And I was like, I was just a young girl. I don't know what I'm doing here. And they would critique your songs in front of everyone. So it wasn't like we were competing it's like, it's at It's like America's places. Got Talent kind of, but for yeah, songwriting. Yeah, but for songwriting. And if you won, you got signed. And my second year I did it and I was like, dad, I don't want to go back. And he's like, your album's way better now. Let's go back. The second year I got signed. And everyone's like, Megan's the one that got picked this year. And I was like, I did it. <laughs> That's amazing. But, Do you yeah. remember any feedback from the first year that like stayed oh, with you? Oh, killed or like me. Yeah. My lyrics didn't make sense because they didn't. Um, my production was bad. and But they saw potential. They're like, it's in there. You just got to be better at like, maybe you shouldn't have said that here or this doesn't really rhyme and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, they don't know anything. I'm like, <laughs> dad, they suck. <laughs> um, but then I went home and I wrote a whole new album and sent it in. And then it was like night and day. And they're like, wow, you took our notes and you came back. So it was great. And everyone should do it. <laughs> and it sucked. And it was great. But and my parents would make fun of me because I'd be like, I don't want to go. And they would drag me. And then when I'd be like, when I'd go, I'd be like, that was the best thing ever. I rock. And yeah. they're like, see? <laughs> How so, how do people get that courage though? Because I feel that supportive parents. You that was it. <laughs> that was it. Really? My parents believed in me so much, and I was bad. Like I wasn't horrific, but I was bad. Like I hear the songs now, and I'm like, what were you guys thinking? And my mom, like nowadays, she's like, she's still trying to get those 15 year old songs cut. Like they're sorry, not cut. Uh, a lot of people don't know what that's what that means. When I say like get a song cut, I mean an, another artist sing it. So she's still trying to like sell those songs. And I'm like, mom, they're embarrassing. <laughs> like there's sometimes those songs will get pitched and they'll get cut. And she's like, I knew it. Like I knew you were good back then. And I'm like, wow, you really believed in me. Wow. And my parents are those parents that are like, everyone should go to college. And for me, they were like, go to work. Like go be a songwriter. This is what you're good at. You're going to do this forever. What? How do you think they noticed that? Like what was it in you? Because obviously, and that's wonderful to hear that, but they obviously saw something. Yeah. And they saw a habit, a trait, a pattern, yeah. some work ethic. What did they see? I think my worth ethic at a young age, like I wasn't getting all A's in school, but I'd get like B minuses and C's and whatever. But I would come home after school every single day and I would use the production that my dad would get me at Christmas time. I'd use my computer and I would be in garage band to logic and I would write a song after school every day and I'd play it for them by dinner time. So in like four hours, I would write and produce a whole song and be like, check this out. And it was me like loving what I'm doing. It didn't feel like work, but it was also me showing my parents like, thank you for buying this for me. And like, wow. I'm going to make you proud with this someday. And my dad, my dad was like, this is a credit card where I'm buying all your stuff on. You can pay me back later when you're a successful songwriter. I'm like, I'm wow. buy you a house. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> how, do, how does it feel now that you're a mom? Like, how does that oh, feel man. like how are you taking parts of those gifts that your parents gave you to yeah, pass I, them on and like my parents were and are the best like my mom she would be here today but like yeah i was i heard she was gonna come i was really hoping to meet her. i know yeah. but we're trying to be nice with covid and like keep like we're keep always like safe. pick one person and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but she uh she's my assistant full-blown now like uh, What's that like? It's the best. It's That's the greatest. Amazing. I'm lucky and I have a cool mom. A yeah. lot of people don't like their moms, but my mom is my best friend, my husband's best friend. They are the same person. I think I married my mom. Wow. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they like could finish each other's sentences. It's crazy. I love that. He's, but he's, she's, he's, he's so sweet. sweet. Yeah, he's amazing. They, uh, she's my full assistant because when I had like assistants, I've only had two. One was my best friend and then the second one became my best friend. Wow. And it's, I was just like, it gets uncomfortable. It's like, I don't want to ask you to go get my groceries. But my mom's like, I'm getting groceries. You want me to get some for you? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> like, she's doing it anyways, yeah. you know? My mom was always my assistant forever, but she's not. She's just a loving mom. Yeah. But it's the greatest. And I think having the supportive family is the only reason why I'm here. I mean, I know it is. Yeah. That's and, why and, I keep them close. And how do you try and do that in your own way now? Like, how are you doing that for your kids apart from building them amazing uh, 
water well, slides. My kid sees my his uncles every day because they live in my house. <laughs> so I'm he's surrounded by family all the time. And I think that's a part of his speech delay yeah. is like, like literally they're like, is he the only baby here? I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all adults and we all give him whatever he wants immediately. Wow. They're like, so let's wait till he asks <laughs> and then you may give him his snack. I'm like, yeah. love it. So yeah, it's a matter of too much love. But um, I also want to give him three siblings. Like yeah. blah, 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 yeah. immediately. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you're working on that? Working on that. Working I think December, I'm going to try to get knocked up. I love it. <laughs> Hope, yeah. I feel like for so many people, family is their contention point, right? Like that's yeah. where they experience toxicity. It's where they experience it could be tricky. generational negative trauma. patterns and trauma. Whereas you have this beautiful setup and you're working on it. Obviously, it's not just like that. What do you think your parents or your family has done right over time to maintain that when you just said that you're your kids surrounded by uncles and like that's so beautiful when it works yeah and then there's so many people who have, what is it that yeah, you think your parents like, did differently what did or what have you observed i'm intrigued because i think that could be huge for people i'm breaking a lot of uh generational trauma and generational patterns which I've learned with my therapist. Um, <laughs> shout out therapist. We were, shout out my therapist. Um, my new song, I said, my therapist told me to write you a letter. And she's like, you put what? I was like, <laughs> yeah, I wrote about it. Um, but as I've learned about like why I am who I am, it makes sense through my parents. Like no one's perfect in my family. We look great, but there is some darkness. Course, There's course. some clouds. And, yeah. and I've just tried my very best to break all of that. And my mom is so good at adjusting and learning and seeing like, oh, we can change. We're not like this forever. Like my mom's side of the family, they never talk about what's bothering them. We call it, her last name was Jekinowski. So we call it the Jekinowski secrets. And they never bring up how they really feel. And I'm like, we're not gonna Jekinowski secret this. <laughs> we're gonna talk right about it. Here's how you make me feel. Yeah. And um, that has, my mother has changed significantly. The only category where she's still slacking is the self-talk, self-love. Right. Bad. Bad. Yeah. Which is where I got it from. And she knows. So she's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, she won't take a picture. Like, she'll say, the camera will break. I'm like, what? That's so aggressive. Like, <laughs> she's so mean yeah. on her and on her, hard Aww. on herself. And I, and she's a part of that generation, too, that, like, refuses to get therapy. And my dad. I told them recently, I was like, you would both benefit very well if you had therapy. And they were like, I know what's wrong with me. I don't need to talk about it. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh my God, you're so lost. <laughs> like, So I'm trying to slowly get them into therapy. And, and I've noticed my brothers now, they're close to their 30s. They have all woken up and seen like, oh, we have alcohol abuse in our family. I should be sober. And that's what my brother has done. And he's like an amazing human now. He yeah. was great before, but he was poisoned you know yes yes and then even my younger brother like he's just they're they've grown up so much and i think it's by watching me change my ways and change the patterns of the family and break those bad habits yeah. that we can us millennials man we're doing some work <laughs> it's exhausting but somebody's got to do it because i will not have my kids have these bad patterns yeah you know what i mean they'll just so, have other ones now because yeah they'll make up their new stuff yeah they, yeah no but that's i i love hearing that and it's it's wonderful to understand that everyone is needing help from an individual if you want to change an area of your life like i just feel like one of the things I'm certain about is that if I'm serious about something, I better be accountable to someone else in that area of my life, whether yeah. that's a therapist, a coach, a personal trainer, whatever it may be. Yeah. And I think if you're privileged enough and accessible enough to have that help in your life, it can make a huge difference. But knowing that your parents aren't doing it yet, yet they are using the language. My mom's. Of, yeah, yeah. She's yeah, much better. Yeah, she's yeah. using the language. She my understands dad's like, it. Remember, my dad's 20 years older than my mom. Wow. So yeah, he's like 74 and she's 54. So she's like cool young hip kids. And yeah. my dad's like, this is how it always is. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but he's sweet and great. I love that. In, in the beginning of your journey in music, today we know that a lot of your relationships inspire it. You just said that, you know, your therapist told you to write a letter. And so like you, you hear the toxic or poor relationships you've been in that have inspired music. What was different about what inspired you back then and what inspires you now? Like, do you, do you ever think about that? Like, what inspired your songwriting then and now? 
Well, back then, I was a songwriter writing for other artists. So I was thinking like, what's not on the radio and what what could be on the radio? But I, when I wrote All About That Bass, it was like a joke. Like it was like, I was like, no one's gonna cut this. We've wasted a day of work and we'll just write a therapy song for us. Like, cause the co-writer was like, a man and it was the first time meeting him so it's kind of like a blind date and you're like where'd you grow up how are and we both were like we were chubby kids and we had to learn how to love ourselves and i was like how funny would it be that's like i ain't no size two but i can't shake it shake it and i'm like i'm not a confident dancer that dances in front of everyone but imagine if i was and i remember being like i'll sing the demo who cares and it was like a raw demo with no autotune and nothing but the lyrics hit so many people that they're like, this is going to be huge. Who's singing it? We'll just let her do it. So it was really from like a, a weird raw place. Like I wasn't chasing radio. I wasn't. And I fell into that before when you talk about competition. I didn't know about charts and all that stuff. When they're like, you're number one. I was like, fantastic. <laughs> like, what is that? Like, number one everywhere. They're like everywhere. I was like, well, that was easy. <laughs> so then anytime I did another song, I was like, it's not number one everywhere. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> and then I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing what's on the radio. And then yeah, I yeah. caught myself chasing radio and just falling on my face. So with this new album, Taking It Back, I was yeah. like, I'm going to go back to when I did doo-wop and just didn't care about any charts and anything and just do me. Yeah. And you'll hear that come out. And the first song they put out was a emo toxic relationship song. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> coming out passionate <laughs> yeah and so it sounds like it's always been a raw emotion that's yeah. that's gone out and now you're taking it back and yeah. you're going back to that and you're really owning that like with this with this new album would you say that we're hearing you through the healing process are we hearing you healed are we hearing you i think you're, on he- the other you're side? hearing like- you're hearing a healed mature mother who um is just ruthlessly honest you know like one song, Don't I Make It Look Easy, that I teased today on my Instagram, um, is like talking about, don't I make this look easy? Like everything's perfect. Because everyone who interviews me is like, you are so fun and yeah. you have the best family yeah. and the best life. And I'm like, I cry so much. You just don't mm. know it because I don't film myself and post it, you know? Mm. So I say in the first verse, like I posted a picture. I read all the comments. I hearted the good ones. And if I'm being honest, I probably spent an hour on it. Yeah. And then I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> and... It's just like a fun way of being ruthlessly honest. Ruthlessly. Yeah. That's not a word. But brutally honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's your take on that? What you just said of like, there's a lot of people who will say, oh, well, if we're not taking pictures of ourselves crying and our videos of ourselves crying and posting it, we're only posting the highlight reel. Like we hear this all the time. Yeah. What's your personal take on what showing up authentically means to you? Uh I just noticed when I do talk about my fun, private, personal stuff, like my bathrooms, it goes viral. Mm. People love it. People are like, what? She's goofy. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's always a good reaction, which feels great. Yeah. Like I use that as my therapy of like, oh, the world likes me for just who I am. So yeah. I'm just going to do that. And the yeah. more I did that, like literally the more popular I got or the more people wanted to talk to me. The more I just like talk, that's why I did the podcast because we talk about private stuff that I'm like, normalize it. Like (laughs) I have hard poops, you know, like, and it it just, it makes, I think it's more relatable and people are like, I have that problem too. That's in the first place I saw that was my mental health. Mm. When I saw Carson Daly on the Today Show explain a full panic attack, my mom didn't understand what was happening to me. My Mm. best friend, she couldn't understand. She couldn't help me when I said, I need to go to the emergency room because I can't breathe. And she was like, just come here, I'll rub your head. I'm like, you don't get me right now. I sent her that article and she was sobbing and was like, I finally get it. Because I couldn't put it into words. And when Carson did it, I was like, you don't know what you did for my whole family. Like, Have you ever told him that? Oh yeah. Yeah, Every time I'm at the day show, I'm like, Carson, (laughs) save my life. He saved my family relationship. Yeah. Because I resented them for that. I was like, how do you not understand what I'm going through? You're my mother. Like, you're my favorite human being on this earth. Like, and, and now she still cries about it. She's like, I didn't know what you were going through. And then she'll look back at her life and go, oh, I had a panic attack that day. I thought I was just having a meltdown, but my heart was stopping that day. Like I thought I was going to die. And I was like, yeah, we're riddled with anxiety and you guys weren't allowed to talk about it, but we are. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> help. <laughs> I'm like the biggest fan of screaming for help. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, something's wrong. Somebody help me. <laughs> <laughs> what was your worst experience 
with panic or with with panic that you remember so strongly where where you didn't feel anyone was there to help and you were screaming out for it i was in new york city my first like big real panic attack was 4 a.m it's one of those like never forget 4 a.m i was in glam getting ready to announce the grammy nominees for the year after i won it's like a thing you do when you win you go announce them and it was going to be live with gail king and my assistant who's my bestie still is she was reading me my schedule for that week and it was like sing here perform there after all my vocal issues were happening and i'm just like if i do that this will my voice will die and none of you will make money you know like yeah. uh, we're all going down so i was reading this calendar and i was like but how would i if i go from there to uh, oh there, there's no way i'm gonna make that and then i started getting light i get a little tingly every time i talk about it ah. you start dissociating like you start leaving your body like a ghost and like breathing you start thinking about it and full panic comes in and i started crying because i was like I think I'm dying and and I was like what's going on and I just had to scream cry and breathe and my husband who was my boyfriend at the time and my assistant looked at me and said this is a panic attack and I almost wish they never said that because I was like what this is what that is because I didn't know yeah I didn't really know what people were saying like how they felt you don't know until it's happening and then when it ended they were telling me what's this I was like a lamp a TV, a rug, and that like snaps you yes. back into your body. And once I calmed down, they were like, I was like, can that happen whenever? And they were like, mm hmm. Wish they didn't say that either. Yeah. Screwed me for the rest of the day because I was exhausted and I went on live TV and I haven't watched that clip since. But I remember I blacked out on the TV and was just on autopilot. And I was like, don't pass out. Don't pass out. Don't die. Like, don't have a freak out live on TV with Gail King. And as soon as they were like, done, I sat down on a chair and I lost it. And all the people on the Gail King show saw me and they looked at me like I was a crazy person. And they're like, is she okay? And my team looked at me and they're like, we need to stop. I was supposed to go do like eight more interviews a whole day of work and they just said, stop. I went back to the hotel room and I literally would run to the bathroom thinking I would have diarrhea. I was like, no guys, it's cool. I just have the flu. And they were like, mm -mm. and I would explain it to people like it was like the movies, like when a demon takes over my body yeah. and I had no control anymore. And when a doctor tells you it's your own brain, you're like, well, then I'm going to be in a psych ward like this every day because I can't control that. I don't know how to. And then also I overdosed on edibles, <laughs> which like you can't really do, but I did it. I usually would take I was self-medicating myself with five milligrams of weed with edibles at night and it really helped in the beginning and it would help me sleep and one day i ran out of the specific edibles that i took and i ate like a lollipop that was 25 milligrams then i was so high that i forgot i ate that and i ate another one and i usually take five right i was up to 50 in 50, one day 50 milligrams in one day i was doing a puzzle and i was like I'm not breathing. Like I, so I tell people my soul left my body. I said bye bye, and I was dry heaving all night, and that is very similar to what you feel in a panic attack. <laughs> so, going to those places twice, my brain was like, "We've been there, and we yeah. could take you there wherever, whenever we want." Wow. And so I was really unbalanced. My chemicals were off for a long time, months, trying to figure out. Like some days would be horrific. Couldn't get up. Some, and I was, I was madly in love. My career was great. I would tell doctors, like, I'm not depressed. I didn't feel depressed. I just sometimes, if I, like, sometimes I'll just feel like I have a migraine for the rest of the day. I'd have ice packs on my head. I'd have my mom check my temperature. I was like, no, I just have a flu again. This is crazy. And then I finally went to a psychiatrist and he explained to me, your chemicals are like this. And all day long, your body is saying, fire alarm, fire alarm, fight or flight, run. And I was like, mm-hmm. Like I was sitting with him and my back felt like it was on fire. I was like, see, it's crazy. It's happening right now. It's Feel it. I think it's really hot. He was like, no, your chemicals are so messed up that your body doesn't know where you're supposed to be. Your adrenals are on fire. Mm. So I went on my first ever antidepressants. And I used to get complimented like, wow, you're the only pop star not on antidepressants. And I used to be like, well, look at me. Yeah. And now I'm like, that's messed up that they said that to me. Yeah. And like it made me judge people and it, it was yeah. horrible. And now 
when I was on, when I was finally on the medication, I'm on like the lowest dose. And after a month or two, I was like, it's quiet. Like everything stopped and it was amazing. And I like would talk to my psychiatrist of like, I only had one panic attack this month and it slowly went down and I, it's been like five years now and I haven't had a terrible one since. I'll have nights if I'm over exhausted or my, I'll say my body's trying to trick me right now and trying to pretend I'm in a panic attack. And I know what you doing. You can't mess with me right now. <laughs> and my husband knows too. He knows the drill. Like it saved my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would do without those pills. And I'm sorry, I'm blabbing, but I no, have to not say this all. too. This is incredible. Please carry on. I'm when I was pregnant and I told people I want to get pregnant. So my doctor, I, um, they were saying this pill is safe that you're on, but this low dose of Ativan is not safe. Get off of that. So I did get off of that. And when I walked into my doctor appointment, pregnant, like day one pregnant, I was, I brought my medicine was like, this saved my life. And he was like, oh, you could throw those candies away. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't know what to say. I was so scared. And I was like, it was COVID time. So I couldn't yeah, hide yeah, yeah. my husband. I was like, what? And I was in shock and I stayed with that doctor for like weeks and just got worse. And I cried to everyone of like, he just wants me to throw him away, but they saved my life. And my other doctor said, it's totally safe to be on these. So I don't know what to do. And I eventually changed doctors and she was, I had a woman doctor and she was like, that's insane that he said that to you. These are perfectly safe to be on, you're fine. And a happy mom is a happy baby. And I've been trying to tell every pregnant mom or anyone who's going to have a baby and on antidepressants, like you, you can safely stay on them and nothing bad will happen to your baby. And I never had any postpartum. I didn't have any depression while pregnant. And my pregnancy was obnoxious. I had gestational diabetes, but wow. we did it. We crushed it with <laughs> a good diet. Diet while pregnant. And I was like, what? I <laughs> said so no, no cravings. Yeah, but like, it's still like the stigmas yeah in some of the doctors and yeah. it's like and my baby came out c-section because he was sideways and my baby was in the NICU for five days and all those nurses said were you on antidepressants and i'm i just got sawed open i'm on drugs like trying to heal i feel horrible i don't get to see my prize that i <laughs> went through yeah, all that yeah. for and i'm in there trying to look at him in the NICU tank and they're like well it's because you're on antidepressants that's why he won't wake up i'm like what and I asked all my doctors and they're all like, dude, there's no science that backs that. They're just pointing so they don't get sued. They're just saying, well, it's because you're on antidepressants and that's why. Um, and it was the most discouraging thing. And I'm writing a book about it because it was it messed me up. And I still talk to my doctor, my psychiatrist recently, because I'm trying to get lower on my antidepressants in case I want another baby, even though there's no science that backs that that can hurt that. Baby. And then what happened after that? My doctor's like, I, I got the charts later because Dr. Amon's like, what? Like, show me show me how they proved that. Yeah. And all the chart said was like, he's sleepy. He's not waking up. He wakes up on his own time. But it was a C-section. That's just traumatic for a baby totally, to come out. Yeah, yeah. Anything can happen. And it wrote, mom 27 on antidepressants. That was it. And I was like, you know, it's the worst thing you could tell a person who just had a C-section. It was like, so, it's your fault that yeah. this kid's not awake. Wow. But I can't wait to have three more kids. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And you weren't blabbing at all. It was actually really... Blah, 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 blah. No, not at all. Honestly, it was so... Thank you for taking us there because I think, uh, you yeah. know, it's very easy to gloss over some of the detail, but actually to hear the details, what allows us to really empathize in the best way possible, but also just to... Uh, recognize how much stigma there is even hearing the statement yeah. where you were saying that oh you're the only music artist that's not on these yeah and now it's like oh these are gonna and cause no one you in my family is baby. on them they yeah. should be yeah they could be i have like plenty of people in my family that i'm like oh bipolar undiagnosed like for facts and yeah. like sometimes they know it and they use booze to help it and i'm like there's better ways i take my pill and a half at night every night and I feel great and I don't have to chug a bottle of booze or eat edibles like yeah. there's a way that a safer way that you could do this um so yeah those pills help me but my whole family that they come from a place that's like you need medicine yeah to make you feel better I'm like uh-huh and the best is when like a doctor said to me well you have asthma right and I was like mm -hmm. he's like you have an inhaler I was like mm-hmm 
It's like, why can't you have yeah. medicine for your brain? Totally. Period. What, what do you think it was for you that drew you in that direction of wanting to change your habits? Because like we see with so many musicians, uh, with so many artists as well, it's so easy to go down the other road. And like you're saying, it's not about looking down on those people. It's just they didn't have a family. but you're support, They yeah. didn't have the support. But what was it for you? Because obviously, like you're saying, that the majority of a family may not really understand why you need medicine. But you met a psychiatrist. You've been very proactive here. Yeah what made you so convinced that you had to make this change and that you wanted to find this way out because it's so easy and natural for you to turn towards alcohol? I was for sure spooked and I um, I knew something was wrong. Like I knew my chemicals were off, but I didn't know my chemicals are off. I was like, my body's broken. My brain is broken and I need help. And I was scared. Yeah. I was scared. I saw me in a psych ward forever for the rest of my life. And I was like, well, I don't want that. Yeah. I want children. I want a family. I want a career. I want to keep going. Like finally all my dreams came true and this is happening. No way. I'm going to fight this. So I wanted to fight it. But also it really, really helped me, which is another reason why I talk about all my stuff in case it helps someone is people like Carson, but also my older brother, Ryan. He used booze and drugs for his anxiety and he's had huge panic attacks that he never told us about. Like he lived in our um, in our house and in his room. He would he told me, oh my god, I would. I was pretty sure I was having a heart attack, thinking it was the drugs, but it would be like a hangover. Wow. Convinced, and he would call it scary Sundays. And I was like, this whole time you just have crazy panic disorder, but you've been like smothering yourself with booze and drugs, flying through it. He's like, yeah, stuff it down, fly, eat some drugs, you'll be fine. Like, drink your medicine. That's what he would say. I'm going to drink my medicine. I'm going to go to bed. Like, he has sleep paralysis. He has the most, his brain's way worse than mine was. So when I would have my panic attacks, I would go to everyone in the house. He lives in my house. And I'd be like, something's wrong. And he'd go, I've been there. I know what you're feeling. Go to the emergency room. Ask for the lowest dose of medicine that you can get. Do not let them give you Xanax. And then come home and you're going to be fine. And having him, like, my older soldier brother, that could get through anything look at me and be like i've done this you're, you're okay instead of my mom being like what are you talking about you don't need a hospital he'd be like go yeah. go to the hospital they'll tell you you're fine they'll give you oxygen you'll come home you'll be great and having that like acceptance but also not be alone feeling was like he saved me wow and that's why i do this podcast with him because wow. he's He's now trying to be sober. And in our first episodes of the podcast, he like you can see him freaking out. And he's like, I don't get to have my medicine. And I and he did it cold turkey. He didn't go to any AA and nothing. No no therapy, no help. He did it by himself, which is so dangerous. Don't ever yeah, do that. Yeah, very, very, very Now yeah. we're hearing like he could have had a heart attack in yeah. his sleep. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, yeah. He he's I would tell him, I'm like, you're you're on extra time, bar yeah, you're on borrowed yeah, time, wow. my guy. But wow. he's my hero. Very looking forward to meeting him now. You're gonna even, love even, him. Even more so, you are yeah. gonna love him. <laughs> even more so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What what an incredible story. And to have you both go through that. To and get, we like, we've had like amazing guests like Dr. Drew on our podcast and he loves like he's so funny. He loves celebrity rehab, so he loved Dr. Drew. So when Dr. <laughs> I've been like, Ryan, you gotta go to therapy, you have demons in here, like yeah. let's go treat them. That's trauma. He was like, No, you're obnoxious, I'll never do therapy. Dr. Drew came on our podcast <laughs> and was like, Brains heal brains. Yeah. You need another brain to heal you. Yeah. And he was like, You're absolutely right. Went to trauma <laughs> went to trauma therapy that week. I was like, I love it. So we all... whatever you tell him, he'll be like, Yes, sir, I will do that. <laughs> like So you're gonna have to write me a little list. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, tell yeah, him. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. But it is true. We all need to hear it from different voices, different, different brain. faces, yeah. different brains. Like, can't be his little it, sister. Like, yeah. Go to therapy. <laughs> no. But no, but now you're doing that for everyone who's listening and watching us. Like I'm I, I, I can't yeah. imagine everyone who just heard what you just shared and everyone who's watching this. It's like there is no one who could have heard that and not be transformed. Like genuinely, I hope so, said. man. Because yeah. like what Carson did for me is what yeah. I'm just trying to do for anyone out there. It's beautiful. Because there's still parents out there that are like mine that are uneducated and don't know. And they're raising babies like me who didn't know yeah. and had that stigma forever. Yeah. And, 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 and I look at my family and I'm like, oh, man, like my grandparents would really needed this. You know, like there yeah. was there was cra real crazy trauma back then in my family. Yeah. And that just goes down the line. Yeah, and I feel you only saw it on the public figures. So I just watched the Elvis movie that just came out. Mm -hmm. And then obviously Bohemian Rhapsody about Freddie Mercury a few yeah. years ago that came out. And you start 
studying the stories of all these incredible icons and artists and you see alcohol and you see drugs yep. and you know and you see that go to a a bitter end you know yep. and it's it's painful when your heroes and your yeah. inspirations go that way but now when you see them go the other way it's it's so it's, isn't it so cool though that now it's like the rock stars that were like our heroes but they died of an overdose were like ugh we can't do that nowadays. Like health is in right now. I it's hope so. Sick. We want to make it more in. I hope. I know. I want to make yeah. it more in. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. even body types. So it's like yes. fitness is hot. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I want to work out and be hot. You yeah. know, be fit and healthy, not like and strong. And, yeah, I yeah. want to be strong. I want yeah. muscles. I see yeah. muscles in my thighs now, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm so hot. <laughs> like. <laughs> It's what sick. what do you think that got you to that place of your and and it's so interesting how so much of it is chemical and I and I've been thinking about that a lot lately that I know so many people who get into a negative rhetoric in their head where it's like I'm the worst I'm I'm spirals. this I'm that and it spirals and they think there's something wrong like mentally or psychologically and there are ch changes they're needed but so much of it is chemical like I had. I've, I've spoken about this a few times. It sounds so average, but when I heard it from my doctors and my teams, it, it fascinated me. So I went recently, I was not mm, probably in the last 12 months, 24 months, I was feeling more tired. And there's plenty of reasons for that. We were renting a house during you COVID. You work hard. <laughs> no, 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 there's that. But we were renting a home during COVID. During the daytime, it was beautiful. And at nighttime, it didn't feel so beautiful. And it was like, there were animals in the floorboards and animals in the walls. And like, so you could hear scratching at night and like uh. steps, you know, like it was, it was hard to sleep. And we just rented it during COVID to have a bit more space. And so I was dying to move out and hence we got this place and moved. But during that time, I don't think my sleep quality was good. And I always sleep eight hours a night. I'm very, I don't negotiate with my sleep. I sleep 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Very important to me. Same. But but at that time, even though I was in bed for that long, I wasn't getting good quality good sleep. sleep. Yeah. And so I was, I was feeling exhausted. So I started checking in with my doctor and they said, your vitamin D levels are at a 10. Healthy is 100 and average is 60. And my, my, my doctor said to me and my nutritionist and my health team that I have, yep. they said to me, they said, Jay, we don't know how you're not depressed. Literally. And I was like, I'm not depressed at all. I'm absolutely fine. And they're like, but your chemicals in your body show yep. complete. And I was like, that's fascinating to me that sure because of my meditation and mindfulness i was able to not be depressed. but you could be depressed just because you don't have enough vitamin d in your body like Literally. it can be as simple as that well i got a dietitian yeah. who um tra transformed my life she helped me healthily lose 60 pounds which was like one pound a week of changing my lifestyle wow but food is poison you know like bad foods i just saw a tiktok where this guy was like i had anger issues and i was mean and i was in high school and even though i was like a smart kid i i remember i ate like the burger and the cafeteria food every day yeah. and no matter how smart i was i was like i'm gonna go fight today because i was angry and when i started eating healthy i was less wow. angry like yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i have a cousin who has really anger issues but i also know he eats fast food because my it's like food's expensive and they yeah. can't go to whole foods like me all the time Absolutely. and so and there's three of the three kids so his mom's trying to feed all of them but I know that that food is just feeding his anger and his, you know, so it's super sad watching that knowing like, oh my God, the rest of the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the challenge, right? It's how can we make food affordable, accessible, yeah. healthy, tasty? My like, dietitian, she's like, don't even get me started on f like the food, uh, food in, yeah. in cafeterias though for kids, yeah. for children. It's like, how do you expect them to work all day? And like... Eat have that. energy yeah it's so like i would come i remember now when i would come home from school nap every day bro i'd nap and my mom be like it's dinner wake up i'm like okay <laughs> like no wonder i was like <laughs> chubby and depressed and sad like yeah and it's hard again because it's all habits yeah I, I was saying recently to someone like our biggest crisis is a crisis of habits like yeah. our life is defined by habits yeah and we've just adopted a ton of bad habits mentally physically yep. emotionally and now we keep repeating them that's what growing up is that's is it breaking all these ha habits my dietitian's like you have to and my therapist is like you have to rewire your whole brain yes everything you knew is wrong and yes. i'm like oh my god yeah, no, like, and even so my, my poor mom like she was even trying to help us like we were that family we're all chubby and my mom was like we're gonna do weight watcher snacks but like back then like it's still crap yeah. like it's still like what are you eating and she tried she tried to get all the low calorie orange juice and we're like 
or it's the orange juice is the issue yes, you know yeah, like yeah, it's got so much but they tried they're uneducated they didn't know so yeah, of course they didn't know my mom was just doing her very best but when i look back i'm like oh my god i was eating poison like yeah it i used all to eat four sense. chocolate products a day like i used to eat chocolate biscuit <laughs> I used to eat Reese's every yeah. day bro what are I you talking chocolate about biscuit, a chocolate bar a chocolate yogurt and a chocolate ice cream every single day were you fat yes and it was Love amazing it. that's why you're so nice it was amazing <laughs> it was like you know I, boys and girls club no it's like a place that? where no. kids can go after school okay we had that on nantucket and we had our little snack thing we had i had cheez-its reese's blue powerade every day oh my god horrific yeah after school i go eat that and yeah. then play yeah and and that's what and, and it took I was me active. ages <laughs> my wife had to powerfully train me out of my addiction to chocolate and i know that sounds so like no i, I need to do that say, to daryl i was literally addicted to sugar he's addicted to sugar i was addicted it's to sugar so and my wife had to completely train me out of mm-hmm. it and it's been an amazing journey for me yeah. because it sounds like oh, it's sugar who cares it's like sugar's no, really it can get really bad crack. Like, yeah it's like sugar's like the one it's that poison. everyone gets away with yeah like people like when someone gets sober from alcohol or drugs we're like my brother he's like i love sugar yeah. i'm like careful my guy i literally <laughs> was dependent on sugar for so many yeah. years and it, and it took ages to get off of it and even now i found i'm now at the other side which is really beautiful where now even when my mind still tricks me into wanting really unhealthy food yeah when i have it i actually don't enjoy it oh as much and anymore. you get sick yes yeah it i notice anytime anymore. i cheat now i get ill and yeah. i'm like like when you drink a bunch of booze and you're like never again it's yeah. like that and i'm yeah. like oh this is poison i forgot like yeah. and you have to remember no, no. that never again yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 tell, tell me about your you're in such a and you've spoken about in this interview already you're in a healthy relationship now uh, you know, and you have been for a long period of time, obviously, with Daryl. With food and yeah. my man. I was yeah. about, yeah, I was about, <laughs> yeah. I was about with, with love. Yeah, yes. yeah, with love. Yeah. I won. And, and I, just got, I got lucky. And I'm so grateful I got to meet Daryl today as oh, well, because it's always fun. Like, and Yeah, he's amazing. How did you know that that was how you were meant to be treated? Because I think so many people get into a pattern of accepting a certain level of treatment. Yeah. How I always, you know? I figured like, because of like relationships I've seen in my family, I'm like, she'll deal with it and I'll, I'll just train him to be better. And when I met Daryl, he still to this day like opens every door, drives me wherever I need to go because he knows I'm scared to drive, takes care of me. No one's ever taken care of me like that except my parents. And he says, I'll take care of you so, to this day. And that's when I was like, oh my God, I want to only be with you for the rest of my life. I want to be 105 and die next to you while holding your hand. And it's taught me how to care for someone and take and love them like that. But um, yeah, it was like the chivalry, whatever it's called. It was the, it was the kindness and the simple things yeah. of opening doors and making sure I was okay. And he came on tour day eleven after day six when we said I love you. Day eleven, I was like, I have to do a, a tour now. Would you like to come with me? And he was like, Well, I got nothing else to do. So <laughs> and he stayed on that bus and did the whole tour with me. And after every show, he caught me off stage. He would carry me to the. <laughs> the little golf cart <laughs> and he would help me take my wig off and he massage my feet like month one meeting this person and i was like you're gonna take care of me forever wow and he went through me when i had vocal surgery like four months of dating i had vocal surgery i couldn't talk couldn't say i love you back i was mute for months and he still loved me the way he treated me through my pregnancy was insane just like and, and it makes me like as much as i tell the world like Hey, via mental health, ask for help. I also want to say, hey, don't settle, you know, because there's a guy out there that will rub your nasty feet after a two hour show (laughs) and will worship the ground you walk on. They exist. And I know it's hard in LA to find them, but I found them. (laughs) And if I can find them, you can find them, you know, like they are real. And it's the people you want to procreate with. Like he never saw himself as a father because his father left their family when he was one years old. So he was like, I'm not gonna be a dad. I don't know what a dad is. He saw me and was like, I want babies with you. Like I want to procreate. I want to make more of us. And I was like, we should make more of us. (laughs) It's like, that's, I think that when they're like, you know, when you know that whole thing is like, oh, I want forever and I want more of yous. I want to make more of yous. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I love that. That's how I figured and it out. Where, where did you get to a point where it was like, it sounds like you were in your early years using your body as a way of validation. Yeah. And like all of, the, when or where are you now at in terms of validating yourself? Like where are you looking for your validation from now? Where is it coming from at this point in um, time? I'm still super hard on my body. Like I've lost all this weight and I still feel exactly the same. 
I'm still like, ah, oh, I can't wear shorts or I can't wear sleeveless things. And and my husband catches me and is, and is like, hey, you're being so mean to yourself. Look how gorgeous you are. And uh, it's a thing you have to work on. I have to reprogram my brain to be like, no, I look good today. And the only thing that I saw actually make a difference, which I truthfully don't do, um, <laughs> is because I got to do it more because it's so hard. My therapist told me stand in the mirror naked for five minutes, put a timer on and just look at yourself. Day one, I was literally shaking because I was like, mm -mm. like it was already tough for me to love my body. But after the C-section scar with all the stretch marks, my family's like smothered in stretch marks. Like it's genetic. So I'm going to get it. Got it. So the stretch marks go up. The C-section goes across. Now I'm looking at myself like a, ma a lawnmower ran over me. Like I've been hacked. And so, and there's no fix in that. So I was like staring at that, like, oh, and all that trauma that comes with it. But after, and I was just looking at the clock, like, please be done. But day three, when I did it, I was like, you know what? Her thighs are cute. You know, I started complimenting her and I was like, oh, I see my brain changing already. And if I did it more, I'd probably be better at it. But like our bathroom, we have a giant mirror in it. So when I, when I get naked every day, I see it. And I think that helps. My mom like avoids mirrors and avoids, yeah. she doesn't want to like have my, my father be anywhere near the shower when she's in it. I'm like, oh my God, I used to shower with Daryl. Like, what? Like, she's very hot. And I think that's what keeps her insecurities stuck there. Yeah. You know, you have to like literally get naked and start looking at yourself. <laughs> yeah. Because wow. like, this is our shell, you know? Absolutely, yeah. This is our, our body. This is it. This is what we got. So like, let's treat it well. Yeah, and I think that's the idea that if we can't look in the mirror and say, I'm happy with what I see today, yeah, it's really hard to think tomorrow you're going to wake up and say, I feel really happy what, with what I see tomorrow in yeah. the sense of even if you've changed, whether you lose weight or gain weight, whatever you're trying to do, yeah. if you're not happy with where you are now, it's never going to feel different yeah. on the other side It's like because that's just a repetitive pattern. Yeah. When people are like, how are you so confident and love yourself? I'm like, ooh, I'm working on it every day. Yeah, exactly. I wrote a song called Working On It, which is why our podcast is that because yeah. it's about when you get a compliment and you're like, ew. And someone's like, you yeah. look beautiful. You're like, shut up. Ew, I'm disgusting. It's like, whoa, I'm going to work on not doing that and go, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like try to believe what they're saying. Because yes. they're not saying it. They're not lying. Yes. You know, like yeah, what's yeah. the benefit of them being yeah. like. Yeah. When I was a monk, we got trained beautifully in how to receive compliments. It was like a big part Isn't of our training. Isn't that the hardest thing ever? Yeah. And it was, but it was taught to us so wonderfully. The first thing was always to receive well from the other person so what you just said like thanking the other person because what you're doing is you're rewarding them for noticing something good yeah so you get an opportunity to say wow like they're noticing something good whether it's in me or not it doesn't matter for now for now it's just we should really acknowledge someone who decided to compliment you versus criticize you the second step Huge. the second step was now that you've done that think about who gave you that quality Think about how you learned it. Did you get it from your parents? Oh. Did you get it from your teachers? Who was it in your life that gave you that gift? And now you get to turn that compliment into gratitude and you get to thank that person. So mm -hmm. internally, when you, when you receive a thank you, not only do you get to receive it, you now get to thank someone else and, and pass that gratitude on. And it's just this beautiful process Sick. of compliments to gratitude, which we know are great for it's the brain. It's all good, yeah. And so it's all good. And so, yeah, I love that you brought that up. It's really special. I love it. Megan, That's what we're this, working on. This has been even more than I expected. <laughs> yes, it has. It is, this has been. Thank you. I knew it was going to be fun, but it's like we've done this beautiful thing where like we've gone really deep and then you're just hilarious and then and then adorable <laughs> like, and then really deep and then hilarious. And it's something like, <laughs> like literally you're good. playing with my emotions, uh, but in, in the most beautiful way. Uh, we end every episode of On Purpose with a final five. So this is the rapid final fire. Five. Oh, gosh. Uh, so you have to answer in one word to one sentence maximum. Oh, I'm okay. so bad at that. Okay, here <laughs> you we can go. try. I we can do try. it. We'll probably go off piece because you're so interesting that I'm going to be like, oh, tell me more. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we'll start. All right. Question number one uh, What is the number one thing you're working on in your relationship? And what's the number one thing Daryl's working on? Understanding his feelings. That sounds good. <laughs> the boy can feel. He's got a lot of feelings. And I'm like, Dr. Phil taught me perception is reality. So even though it seems like he's being irrational, because yes. he is. I have to realize like, oh, he's in that moment right now. And I have to take care of him as if that's real and then pull him out of it. And I always do. I love that. And what's he trying to do for you? <laughs> 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 I 
that's like the, the toughest part for us because I'm so I'm sorry I'm using so many words you're not but I'm so Massachusetts like sack up bro like I'm raised by brothers like why are you so emotional why are you crying and he's like uh, you know so he's trying to communicate better yeah his feelings to me and trying to yeah, I guess. Ask him. Yeah, He'll yeah. tell you. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to ask him. <laughs> it's that. It's yeah. the very, I'm cold and he's soft. Yeah, I get but it. But it works. <laughs> Man, it works. <laughs> Question number two. Uh, what is your daily routine for your anxiety today? My husband, transcendental meditations every day. That's Amazing. not how I say it, but 20 minutes morning and night. I do that sometimes, especially when I need it. Today... I'm gonna, oh, I have therapy today uh, at 4 p.m. We love it. And I'm gonna try to work out. I love that. That's beautiful. That's nice and simple. Easy. Right? Yeah, easy. All right. Uh, question number three What's the best advice you've ever received? Life will get better if you let it from my father. Nice. Question number four What's the worst advice you've ever received? I mean, this isn't the worst advice. I can't think of anything. But you know what we got a lot of when we were getting married and when we were having babies? We would ask older couples, like, uh. It was the worst thing to do. <laughs> we were like, how do you have a marriage so long? And the, the men would say, son, surrender. Or just like, keep your head down. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, don't do that. <laughs> and then having babies, they'd be like, well, your life's over now. And now it's theirs. And I was yeah, like, that's not true. My like life that. has just begun. Yeah. So we hated that advice. Definitely. That's, I'm glad you shared that. Yeah. It can be really, it can be so. It's literally opposite. <laughs> yeah. It's, it can be really, like, really up. detrimental. Yeah. 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 I, re I remember that when I, when I left the monastery and I decided to start doing what I do today, and I was, I was my my biggest fear internally was that I wouldn't be able to serve in the way I wanted to serve, and everyone was just like, "Oh well, now you can't. You're gonna get a real job. You're gonna get married. Like, so you, you're not gonna be able to serve the world anymore." But, and I was just like, you know, now I look back and I'm like, I'm so glad I didn't accept that. Yeah. And same with when I got married, everyone was like, "Oh, you're gonna have less time to do impact and work in the world." And I was like, "You're gonna have a partner now to help you with it." Exactly. Yeah. Literally. No, I, I'm glad you raised that. All right. Fifth and final question. If you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? You cannot bully online. No, I actually like that. Really? That's a great law. Yeah, you can't we've have never a had it. Comment. We've never had it before. <laughs> Imagine if it was all positive comments. Oh yeah. My Instagram's pretty positive. Is like, it? Yeah, same. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, same, same. Then I'm like, oh, this yeah. is great. We've, when we've, they're like, do you read comments? I'm like, yeah, because they're nice sometimes. <laughs> like, I need that little confidence boost. <laughs> Everyone, Megan Trainer, the Woo new album is arriving October 21st, 2022. Very, very pumped to get to know you better, to deepen our relationship, to Dang. deepen our friendship. Let's meditate. Um, and just, yeah, genuinely so, so in awe of the journey you've been on, the steps you've taken and how you're passing that on to everyone else. It's really powerful. So thank you so much for doing that. Thanks, man. Ditto. Love it. Ditto. Thank you. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.